Am I selling this show short if I don't dance my way into the intro? I feel like, I, I mean, I did that for the, the UFC Viva section, and now I've got the Bellator one, and I'm not dancing, and I feel like I'm... Take a like second. I'm Come on. Feel it. you got to feel it. It has to be, you can't force it. It's true. If I'm not feeling it, I can't force it. That's um, more or less a rule for life right there. Well, for sure. It, I take it from love. They say love is like a fart. If you have to force it, it's probably shit. Uh, all right. On that note, welcome to the Bellator 148 Viv section. We are starting off as high as we can be, and um, that didn't come out right, but you know what I mean. <laughs> no, kid. Say no to drugs. That's right. You saw it all the way. You saw it all the way. And uh, we are here to talk about these upcoming Bellator fights. They've got a fun card going on here. Uh, a pretty fun action card, you know, throwing some heavyweights, throwing some brawlers, throwing a couple prospects in there. Something fun to talk about going on this Friday. I am joined by my esteemed, well-regarded, well-respected, much-beloved cohorts, Victor Martinez and Eddie Mercado. Yeah. Yeah, we're doing that shit again, ain't we? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Look, I don't, want, I, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Okay, all right. Hey, listen, it, it keeps child support at bay, so whatever. You're actually helping me here. That's, that's right, that's right. Mm -hmm. throw, a little, uh, throw a little stick out there. Keep everybody a little confused. <laughs> yes. Wrench in the works. Anyway, Vic, thanks for joining me. Eddie. You as well. What What are your thoughts, Vic? First off, I, I want to hear. Why? Well, he wants to pipe in too. Okay. Uh, first off, I do want to thank everybody for joining the Caesar Chavez anniversary edition of the show. Uh, <laughs> we're doing this here. Um, this is a strange one, you know. This is pretty much what we've come to expect from uh, from Bellator and World Series of Fighting in the sense that it is essentially regional plus in some regards. You know, you have a say maybe uh, somewhere within uh, 10 to 13 fights on the average card and a good chunk of that, mostly the prelims are going to be composed not by the more recognizable talent but folks have been poached from the regional circuit which is fine, it, it's not obtrusive to the main product in the end it's not always a detriment although it does seem to uh, uh, bring down the quality overall depending on who they bring in so this card you know, is mostly composed of Bay Area guys You know, it's more of the... Um, it feels a lot more like old Bellator than actual Strike Force, but uh, it still seems promising stylistically. They've got some really decent matchups lined up, and as we're going to see as we go through this, um, going in with the eventual uh, card, which was originally the main event was supposed to include Josh Koscheck. I guess this card was supposed to be a favor to him or some uh, combination of factors to, to, to feature him. That is not the case, but we should hopefully see some pretty decent stuff out of this. Yeah. All right, Eddie. Yeah, it's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Give me a like on, uh, or wait, give us a like on the YouTube. Follow me on the Twitter at the Eddie Mercado. Uh, subscribe to MMANation.com. That's the O T C O M. Give us a like. All that jazz. Uh, Box and Go Gym. Where'd they go? Hold on. There we go. Boom. Box and Go Gym, Norfolk, Virginia. If you're in the area, check them out. If you want to learn to the sweet science, or you're just coming off a real fat, you know, holiday. You want to lose some weight? Go check them out. What All the right, hell is that? Is that like a pet donkey? What the hell kind of mascot is that? Uh, it's a lamb. Oh. The owner's last name is Lamb, so. It's, oh, well, that would have been nice to know going in, because, <laughs> goddamn, that that's still weirding me out. All right, I'll take it. Hey, man. Lamb chops, bro. <laughs> All right, no. So this card, Bellator. Uh, I'm actually really excited about this, oddly enough. I think we have a good mix of just excitement. We have a glory kickboxer slash MMA veteran in Paul Daly. He's taking on a regional guy, so that could make for possibly a showcase if we get lucky, hopefully. I feel like Paul Daly kind of gets more softballs than anybody in MMA. So, you know, we'll see what happens with that. we got three Division One wrestlers going at it. We have a rematch from a no contest, so there's a little animosity there. Uh, we have a potential crossroads fight for two fighters in Ryan Couture and Pitbull Fiere. Did I say that right? Fiere? Fiere. So I'm excited. And we got some heavyweights to just sprinkle in some extra 
potential knockout possibility. So I'm excited. I think it's a good card. So I'm happy. Yeah, it should be fun. <clears throat> All right. On that note, let's just dive right in. We're going to skip a lot of the prelims, talking about them, because as we said, it's kind of regional plus. Um, a lot of the guys on here, you know, we don't, have, have yet to show anybody anything. We've got some debuting fighters even, some guys who are like 1-0, 0-0, 2-1, 3-0. -0. There's a lot of totally unknown dudes that aren't worth spending a lot of time on. So we're going to skip that. Get right to the meat of the card. Javi Ayala, Carl Sumanu, Sumanu, Sumanu Tafa. There you go. Sumanu Tafa. There we go. Yeah. And uh, that fight, first up, heavy, or heavyweight bout, prelim bout, co-main of the prelims, I guess you could say. And uh, Vic, why don't you talk about it a little? Well, usually they tell you not to bet against Samoans, but uh, I don't know. This is this is going to be pretty uh, going to be pretty uphill for him. Uh, he's going to be fighting a guy we've seen a couple of times before in Javier Ayala, surprisingly spry and nimble for a guy who's got uh, his body composition and uh, pretty quick hits. He's very he's deceptively strong as well uh, and hits pretty hard when he cracks a guy in the right spot. Uh, Samoa Tafa is a guy who we haven't really seen outside of the um, Bay Area promotions such as you know Dragon House and uh, uh, you know WFC King of the Cage and you know, all that the all the West Coast sort of um, constellation of of uh, promotions that we see out there and pretty much every sort of higher level guy that he's fought he's lost to uh, he's got losses against uh, the late uh, Shane Del Rosario Lamar Johnson Dave Huckabee Jack May and DJ Lindemann. Uh, the most impressive wins that he's got are against uh, CJ Levesque. Uh, I don't know if you probably heard of him, uh, Warpath Villarreal, and uh, Josh Appelt, including a win that he holds over Javi Ayala from 2013. So this is actually a rematch, which is going to be interesting as well. Uh, he finished Ayala via TKO. Uh, I'm not sure it's going to end the same way, given that Ayala is not the same guy. Certainly seems to have shored up his, um, his wrestling defense, and he seems to have a better tighter striking game and his striking defense has certainly seemed to have improved, seems to have improved just from his time in Bellator alone. So uh, I would certainly favor Ayala here, although I don't think it's going to be some lopsided beating. Uh, it could very well turn into some crazy slugfest. Not the not the typical ugly slugfest that we get from uh, you know, the, the much derided Bellator heavyweight fights that we see from time to time. Um, this could actually be a very, very fun scrap. In fact, I'm banking on it. I don't know if it's I really, it's, it's going to be hard to pick, uh, given how hard these guys hit. But I just say, by virtue of being more complete and being a, a little cleaner in his all-around approach, I'd have to pick Ayala in this one. Eddie, can Sumanu Tafa do it twice? I don't think so. Like Vic was saying, you know, Ayala's a different fighter. He's a little more experienced. He, you know, he. I don't know. I think he's he's got a little something to him. Like he's so deceptively doesn't he doesn't look like a fighter. He doesn't look like, you know, I wouldn't pick him to win a fight, but you know, he gets the job done. You know, he he'll fight you. He's tough and scrappy. But I mean, so is the other guy. So who really knows? I don't I honestly don't care too much about this. I don't think either of these guys are world beaters. Um, but I know the the Suma Sumanu Tafa guy has been knocked out four times, so I gotta go with Ayala. Yeah, I, I have to admit, I was actually, you know, I thought Ayala was putting on a pretty good run when he beat Tiago Santos, Eric Prindle, and Rafael Butler. Yeah. And then he ran into Alex Hiddleston and just got absolutely run over. And it's kind of like I, I didn't expect that. So that's kind of that. That's the, the moment that gives me pause here. Is that I thought he was really had something going. No, but at the same time, you could probably make the case that that says a little more about uh, Hiddleston than it does about Ayala in that sense. Like, I guess we, when I remember when we did the vivisection, we maybe didn't expect his striking to be as good as it turned out to be, uh, or his shot selection to be as smart. You know, we kind of saw him as more of a grappler who was just huge. So, I mean, that he's kind of got that working for him. That that kind of it, it kind of excuses him a bit in that sense. Yeah, but then Huddleston went out and lost to Augusta Sakai, so I don't know. It's yeah, Sakai's kind of not a slouch either, though, dude. That's I, I, I know, I know, but there's a big difference. You know, at, when you're talking heavyweights, there's like 
there's a lot of not slouches, and then very mm. few actually good top heavyweights. And this is true. This is true. We could just say Hiddleston or Huddleston has a a bit of a beef with the Dad Bod Brigade, I guess. I guess so. Yeah. All right. There's no odds on that fight, so we're not going to give them to you. Uh, next up is uh, Elima Le McFarlane taking on Amber Tackett. Vic? Well, uh, for those of you who have not seen it yet, uh, Elima Le McFarlane was the um, fighter who had gone off and uh, had that fight in, um, oh, God, what was it Gladiator Challenge or Explode? That I think it was explode, right? It was explode. It was explode. Yeah. yeah. She took on uh, Katie Castro in the ill-fated video where she got, I mean, literally world starred. Like that. <laughs> I, I think anyone who didn't know what explode was found out through world star because she was there. Um, it's a bit of an unfortunate thing that that video of someone who had definitely been training beating up someone who very likely wasn't is kind of what got her into this uh, Bellator deal. However. Um, McFarlane is actually a uh, she. She is she is talented. She's got some pretty good things going for her, uh, and I think she's eventually going to be able to sort of um, shake that off at some point. She's already got two wins as a professional, uh, including her last outing in Bellator, which was in the uh, Gallard versus Gertz card back in August, where she beat Maria Rios by uh, split decision. So uh, she's going to be taking on the uh, one and one um, Amber Tackett. Who, you know, there's not much out there on her. You know, she's pretty much fought on smaller shows as well. Uh, you know, I, I don't really see many avenues for Tackett to win this. I don't think that there's much on uh, on her grappling, really, to speak of. Um, you know, I just, I see McFarlane training, you know, at 10th Planet. I see her uh, doing her striking out with uh, Liz Carmouche and her team. And I don't know, it seems to be one of those things where I don't really see much of... Uh, a point to this fight other than getting McFarlane another win. That's unfortunate. It has to be said that uh, Tapology, I don't know if, you know, they have this, like, little ranking thing where, like, they give everyone, like, a ranking depending on area, the worldwide, all that. I think there's probably some, some probably somebody misplaced a digit here because Amber Tackett is their number 2,171 ranked pound-for-pound pound woman U.S. fighter in the West. <laughs> in the West. Wow. Yeah. That's the distinction. Not in the U.S., but in the West. I didn't know there was that many the women West, fighters in the West. Where does the West start? Does it start at Wyoming? Does it start at El Paso? Like, Where, where think, do they draw that line? Is that male and female pound for pound? No, I, no it's I, a female specifically. No, it, no it, it doesn't say female oh. specifically. It just says pound for pound U.S. West. Like wow. period? <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, usually I think the West tends to start at uh, Missouri, the gateway arches. Okay. Mm. But okay. technically, it's more like Nevada. Well, I don't know. Well, Nevada is, I mean, that's still Pacific time. Like, I don't know. Uh, well, anyway. Whatever they do. Yeah. Uh, Eddie, your thoughts? Uh, my thoughts, uh, when I saw McFarlane knock out that soccer mom, I, uh, I instantly thought about that. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw it, but it was this uh, a regional fight where the guy was beating this dude so bad that he just – became overwhelmed with compassion and tapped out yeah. because he's tired of beating his ass. I, f I feel like we should have saw that in that fight. Um, you know, that, that was her claim to fame, and she generated a buzz from it, and Bellator signed him and ran signed her, ran with it, and I think that was a real smart move. And uh, I think by feeding her this Tackett chick, it's it'll give her a little more notoriety. Fans will get to see what she can do, you know, showcase some of her skills, and then potentially set up maybe her against the uh, recently signed Anastasia Yankova, the uh, Russian Muay Thai uh, female that just got signed. So, mm. you know, maybe they're just trying to build her up, you know, upper fan base. You know, maybe she'll be a, a little bit of a draw. Yeah, I mean, that is sort of like the Bellator thing is, you know, they pick somebody out and they say, okay, we want to make this person, or the Scott Coker thing is we want to make this person something so they'll get them a lot of good, a lot of solid building fights, and then, you know, try to match them up off that after building them. Yeah, but you um, have to wonder, what are they building towards? They don't have a 125 championship or anything, and, I mean, there's question. not even that much. I mean, if you really want the better flyweights, are really an Invicta as is. Like, they got some really good ones there, so yeah. I don't know what that really means. Well, unfortunately, Bellator has a long history of 
being a really weird adopter of women's MMA. Like, they get go out and get fighters, and then they don't really put on fights. So yeah. Yeah. it's a very weird spot. Should be noted that video of the guy tapping out, though. I don't know if you saw the full one, but he was, like, pretty much winning that fight. Barely, but he came off, like, if you watch the whole fight, he comes off looking a lot crazier than he does sympathetic, and that it was, like, the that was, like, the first good flurry he landed all fight, and then he's like, okay, I'm done. I, I, I can't take it to beat this guy that badly. It's like, dude, you were not winning that fight that hand. So you, are you implying that maybe he, like, blew his wad and got tired and was like, fuck, I'm exhausted, let me out of this? No, I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that he might have been crazy. He might have just been uh, just, more insane than... Wait, 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 wait. Are you suggesting that there are mentally unstable people in mixed martial arts? <laughs> never. Ah, uh, well. Never, 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 never. Well, now I done heard everything. All right, that's that was the, that's the last prelim bout we're going to talk about. We'll get, jump up onto the main card here. Tricky Friere, Ryan Couture, Eddie, lead the way. All right, I'm very interested in this fight. I think we're going to learn a lot about each one, regardless of the outcome. Uh, Pitbull, you know, he's kind of he's at a weird place. You know, it's it's he hit a, a rough patch and then he kind of overcame it, started switching up his training a bit, and he he went on a nice little run and he looked like he was about to, you know, make a legit run at the title. But you know, he had he had a a little tough outing against uh, Derek Anderson, which. In all honesty, I think uh, Pitbull won the fight, personally, but I can also see how someone could score it for Derek Anderson. Real close match. That was a rematch. Um, you know, Pitbull, I mean, in that fight, he, he took his time like he did against Saad Awad. You know, he was real patient, um, especially in that first round. He was letting Anderson just come on forward, and he would counter with really heavy shots, and, you know, that seemed to serve him really well. And he also... Uh, you know he would he would shoot a double leg, you know he would see the takedown present itself and he would he would take that and he would hold the top position although he didn't really do much with it, you know he that still judges you know judges look at that although it didn't go his way that fight but you know so it, you kind of got to wonder where he goes from here if he does lose to Ryan Couture I mean what does that mean for Pitbull does he move down a weight class does he you know I don't really know. Um, with Ryan Couture, I mean, he's a huge question mark himself. Um, I almost feel like the best thing he's got going for him is his name and his father in his corner. I mean, he just he's just not the same kind of athlete that it takes, that, that is required to be championship material. I mean, he's just not, and he knows that, so he, he fights to his strengths, you know. Um, his stand-up is, is just... It's different for sure. His footwork is a little <laughs> it's different for sure. It's uh, different. I mean, I'm not gonna badmouth the kid, you know. He... <laughs> You're a little too late on that, but <laughs> I, I mean, I like the dude. I mean, I think he's, yeah. I think he's a good fighter, but I just feel like he has that regional feel to him. You know, he has that regional movement. Um, he can fight regional guys. But he seems to not do well against the bigger names, the more well-rounded, complete, better athletic – I mean, excuse me, the more athletic kind of fighters. Uh, and Pitbull is that. He's a more technical striker. He is – I mean, Pitbull is a damn good athlete. I mean, this one, I'm not – I'm not sure how, to, how I see this. It's like Pitbull in a slump versus a Couture who desperately needs a win. Well, does Couture desperately need a win that bad? I mean, he's coming no. off. No, he three. needs a name. I mean, he desperately needs a name. That is true. Yeah. That part is I true. I mean, if he beats another nobody, so what? You know? Yeah. He can go to explode and do that. No. I, we'd, I, I don't, don't know. I just, it's hard for me to get a beat on Couture. Well, like, so who are you got, picking? That's the question. I got this weird feeling that Couture's going to win. I really do. I have this – I don't know why. Like, my brain's like, Pitbull is obviously going to win this. He's the better striker. He's got the counter-wrestling. He's, you know, he could hold his own on the ground. But for some Couture. reason – what's that? You're picking Couture, though. I mean, my brain picks Pitbull, but my gut's picking Couture. 
Ah, so, son of a bitch. Let me get a coin real flat. I'm just oh, wow. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right, it's, it's, such a, it's such a tie. But for shits and giggles, yeah, I'm going to pick Pitbull. I don't, watch oh. and I don't watch shits and giggles. I'm picking Backsliding. Pitbull. Save money's, on, pit, save money's on Pitbull. Flip flopping, mm. waffling mother. That brother walked over to the edge and he said, "Nope." <laughs> <laughs> right, I man. stuck my toe in the deep end and I was like, "Ah." Eh. Uh, no, but see, I can respect that. I mean, I, and I, I know where you're coming from. I get that. I, I can understand the uncertainty of. You know, you, well, picking against Pitbull seems crazy when you're talking about a guy like Ryan Couture who's been fighting lesser level guys. But then again, you can say the same thing about Derek Anderson, who beat him twice. Like you can argue and dispute the the the, the scoring and and the uh, the judges that officiated that. That's fine, but eh, I don't know, man. If if Derek Anderson could do it, obviously Derek Anderson was a more complete fighter than than Couture. He uses his range better. His striking is far more precise. His timing is better. But I can I really do think that Couture takes this because I can see him smothering and just suffocating Pitbull with a type of top control that he may not be as used to. Now, obviously, Pitbull's faced wrestlers before. He's gotten them off him. I mean, it's not like he's... uh, This isn't the sort of thing where... Uh, you know he hasn't fought a fighter like him, but it's as far as styles go. But it's just that he's so much better at that pressure and his submission attempts. You know, just breaking a guy down. I can see it, man. I can totally see it happening. And uh, I would actually, as crazy as it sounds, I'm gonna go with Ryan Couture on this. I think he's ready. I think he's probably gotten some of his things together. Dakota Cochran may not have been the biggest uh, uh, name there, but he's also another guy who's gotten a lot better in the last few years. So, yeah, I'm going to give it to him. All right. Vic was willing to go where Eddie couldn't. I appreciate the uh, sacrifice. Mm. On the, yeah, you know, you know, wait, honey, you're the guy with the lamb on this screen. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, uh, I think if Derek Anderson was still in this fight because Pitbull is replacing Anderson, I, I would have picked Anderson in this fight. I would pick Anderson over Couture. Yeah, Anderson's a better athlete, and he, he's an, he's aggressive, he's big, he's tough. He's also just totally, like, I don't know. He's one of the people who, who, who you, can tell he, he's, he, you can tell he came up crushing cans because he does not fight with a lot of technique. Sure. Um, we do have odds on this fight. Patricky Freire is uh, the favorite, minus 270, down to minus 264. Ryan Couture, the underdog, plus 205, up to plus 236. It is tough. Couture is always scrappy. He's always in there. He's always pushing the fight. And Freire is not. He just, he's inconsistent. And he does not necessarily fight uh, the perfect fight to win rounds. So... And Couture does, frankly. I mean, that's the big thing you can see in Couture's corner is that he tends to fight the kind of fight that wins rounds. Why he beat, that's why he got a win over KJ Noons. Yeah. He has this style that's always, like, he's always scrappy, he's always pushing, he's always trying to get something done, and judges tend to reward that. Man, All right, that tough. brings us to uh, another heavyweight bout. Raphael Butler, Tony Johnson Jr., Vic, take this one. Well, uh, this could very well be... uh, It could either go really... is a really exciting, quick bout, or it could be a very tough and hideous slog. I think it all depends on what kind of shape Tony Johnson shows up in, and I don't think... uh, I don't say this as a thing where... uh, This isn't to disparage a man in any way. I just think... I I, I haven't seen him not show up in fight shape or ready to go. Uh... Thing is that he is a very hard-nosed, wrestle-heavy kind of guy, and when you're fighting at heavyweight and you're fighting slow guys, this is something that's going to happen. Um, Tony Johnson is a product of AKA mostly. He's coming off a two-fight uh, win streak in which he beat former champion Alexander Volkov last year. Uh, he's got wins over Derek Lewis as well, and uh, you know another Vel- uh, Bellator veteran, Tony Lopez. Uh, as well as Kenny Gardner of the <laughs> infamous M1 uh, heavyweight scene. Very, very tough here. Um, I don't really see that many avenues for Butler to win. I mean, Butler's kind of shored up some of his submissions, and he does have that striking base as well. 
but uh, it's kind of hard. It's going to be really hard for me to pick against a guy who's a wrestler first and who's just if he can do what he did against Volkov, who's a rangy striker, who's precise, who's fast, who hits pretty hard. I don't see why he can't seem to do that to Rafael Butler. I, and I, I hate to count the guy out because Butler is fun to watch in a lot of his fights. But um, yeah, I just don't see it happening. So I'm going to go with Tony Johnson all day. All right, Eddie. All right. Um, I like this fight. I think it's going to be very exciting regardless. Well, there's a, there's a slight chance for a grapple fest, but, uh, you know, you got two big camps. Butler's been training with Alliance MMA, and you have Tony Johnson, who's with AKA. Um, striker versus grappler, that's pretty much the uh, – that's the plot for this one right here. You got Tony Johnson, uh, Division One wrestler from Iowa State. He's beat uh, Derek Lewis. He's beat um, who did he beat? Tim Sylvia, Alexander Volkov, and he's beaten. Uh, well, he didn't beat, but he fought Daniel Cormier. So he that's beat Kenny Garner and Tony Lopez too early in his career. Yeah. So that's three. Uh, you know, he's fought three world champions already. You know, that's kind of crazy. Like what? And he beat two of them, so I don't know. He's got he's got that uh, he's got that winning style that you know, just like Couture, he wins rounds. You know, he he will push you up against the fence and keep you there until he finds a way to get you down. And if he does get you down, you're gonna have a hell of a time getting him off of you because that is a big boy. Mm. Uh, something like, uh, like Vic was talking about with his uh, you know, his physique and his fight shape or whatever. I mean, he does not look the same as he looked when he fought DC. He fought DC, and he was ripped. I mean, that dude was dreaded. And now, I mean, not that long ago, and he's his body's drastically different. Yeah. Um, there are definitely holes in his striking game. We saw that when he fought Volkov. Volkov was tagging him there at the end of that fight. And, uh, I mean, holes are not what you want in your striking game when you're fighting uh, Rafael Butler. But Johnson comes out swinging for the fences. I mean, he'll come. He'll he knows how to uh, he knows how to uh, set up his takedowns and his he closes the distance well with his punches. You know, he throws these bombs that you have to account for. And while you're accounting for those strikes, he finds his opening to get inside of you. And uh, with Butler, we don't know what his ground's like. We saw him do some top work, but it was, it was a good show. He's got pro boxing experience. He's got heavy hands, solid jab, beautiful counter right. Um, I just, I'm not sold on him for some reason. For whatever reason, I'm just not sold on Butler. And he's, he's fighting the best wrestler he's ever faced. I just, I feel like Johnson has more ways to win and might be the more complete fighter. So I'm going to have to go with Johnson on here. Um, I can see a decision, possible submission. But I'm gonna go Tony Johnson for a while. I think the big reason, big thing in Johnson's favor too is that uh, he's never been knocked out. And he's fighting somebody whose best chance of beating him is probably to knock him out. He seems like a heavyweight who, even if he's not in the best, most amazing shape, is still tough and aggressive and kind of a bowling ball. And Butler, as you know. As athletic as he looks and as good as his punching mechanics are, just he's got a very straight up and down style that seems made to be picked up and taken off his feet and kind of bowled over. Yeah, it's so, a bad style matchup for him for Butler. Yeah. For sure. That uh, the odds have Tony Johnson are are heavily favored towards Tony Johnson. He is minus three fifty one to minus three seventy. Butler the underdog plus three oh nine down to plus 260. It's a bit long for heavyweight odds, frankly. I don't like to see heavyweights get out of the 200s, but... Yeah. I think it's long for heavyweights, and I think it's a little long just for the skill sets of each guy. Yeah. Well, given the sheer chaos that's possible in this fight, that is kind of a weird set of odds, but it is what it is, man. Yeah. It's nothing I'd be like, oh, that's a great betting opportunity. It's just a little weird. No, you don't want to bet on that, no. Uh, that brings us to the co-main event. Chris Honeycutt, Paul Bradley, Eddie lead the way. This is a rematch. Um, last time they fought, they unfortunately it ended early due to an accidental headbutt. It was neither guy's fault. Um, 
I mean, the entire scrap was a little, I don't want to say dirty, but, you know, there, there was a couple fouls going on. I don't think they were intentional. I think it was just it was just a real scrappy, competitive bout. And uh, I learned a lot from it, and I think each fighter learned a lot from it. Uh, the first time, uh, or when we did our last vivisection and I was analyzing the fights, I think I gave Honeycutt way more credit than he actually deserved. Or maybe I didn't give Paul Bradley enough credit because Paul Bradley was able to stuff uh, pretty much every takedown attempt from Honeycutt in that first fight mm -hmm. and uh, briefly got Honeycutt down as well. So as far as who's the better wrestler, uh, I think we found out that we still don't know. We just still yeah. don't know. That's, yeah, it's it's, it's, of, yeah, that's messed up, but it's true. Like. We it, it's it was kind of a stalemate at that point. You have to remember, MMA wrestling very different from just straight wrestling. But yeah, yeah. So you know that was, and and whenever that happens, you know we got a we got an up and coming. We can call him prospect in Honeycut, and you get to see like where his mind's at. Where's his five Q at at this stage? Does he know how to adjust? Does he does he realize like hey my takedown's not working? Let me pump a jab for a bit and see see what else I can come up with, or let's let's make it through this round, get to the corner, see what's going on. But luckily, the fight ended early, so I mean, I kind of feel like the way that fight was going, Paul Bradley might have been on his way to a decision win. I felt like he was handling uh, Honeycutt striking, and Honeycutt almost looked like he was running out of things to do, like he 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 was kind of just running out of crafty things to get inside and get back out. And that's just you know his lack of uh, his lack of striking experience, which we can come to expect. But it's a toss up for me. Like the first fight makes me feel like this fight's going to be even closer. Um, the first time around, I picked Honeycut. Uh, second time around, I'm going out on a limb and I'm going to pick Paul Bradley here. I know. All right. I know, and here's why. Oh, oh! I thought we already heard why, but go for well, it. <laughs> well, here's 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 the my big reason. I feel like Chris Honeycutt has more adjustments to make in order to win this fight than does Paul Bradley. All right, <laughs> all right, Vic, do you agree with that insanely hot take from Young Edward? Yeah, that 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 take was hot fire. Hey, hey, stop that! Quiet, talking to people here. Uh, yeah, all right. I'm not really sure how Paul Bradley, despite his experience, d still doesn't seem like a guy who does much else than. Oh, uh, for the love of fuck! Hang on a second. All right, here we go. Here we go. Ready? Ready? There we go. Real time parenting, folks. All right. So I don't really see how a guy like Paul Bradley, who's been fighting for as long as he has and has such an extensive record, um, I mean, it, he is he is a hell of an athlete. He has a, a, a bit of a cardio problem in some of his fights. And Honeycutt seems like a guy who rightfully so, Bellator is putting a lot of promotional muscle behind because of his sheer athleticism and a lot of the physical talents that he's got, a lot of the things that he's worked on in his skill set. So, you know, I mean, on paper, I could pretty much give Honeycutt the edge here. But, you know, Bradley seems like a guy who might be able to foil his style. And you get two wrestlers like this, and as... We just mentioned, you know, MMA wrestling different from just standard wrestling and collegiate wrestling, which is something that these two guys obviously drew their experience from. Um, I really do think that at some point, Bradley could either run out of gas or, you know, just try to make this a, a, a wrestling battle, and he might not come out on top at this. I could, unless it's some sort of a situation where he ends up getting a decision. I could actually see Chris having more uh, ways to finish him, you know, have either by, either by strikes or by submissions. You know, you could very well reverse him and do something that um, could put Paul Bradley in a lot of trouble. So I'm going to go with Honeycutt on this. Um, I'm not sure what the lines are for this yet, but uh, I don't know, man. I think he hits harder. I think he's just, even though his 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 fight IQ isn't perhaps what Paul Bradley's is. Paul Bradley knows how to fight a safe fight, how to keep his control and not take too many risks. Uh, I do think that the explosiveness and the athleticism are certainly going to be factors that are going to be uh, heavily in uh, on Chris Honeycutt's side. Yeah, it'll, it, this is an interesting fight to me because Honeycutt really does look like he's a uh, great athlete who is still trying to learn the basics of the sport 
he's got you know he's coming out of the dethroned base camp training with Josh Josh Koscheck and I, I think that's actually probably a pretty good thing because Koscheck's a pretty good guy to learn how to trans transition from wrestling to MMA for yeah. through and he's somebody that I, I I think the big thing is I do expect to see Honeycut improve from fight to fight and the fight he had against Bradley like had it been scored from where it was stopped I think he would have won that fight. I could see him maybe going on to lose a decision. He was starting to fade, and Bradley was starting to pick up the pace. But it was still, like, if it had gone to a decision, I could have seen him even, like, you know, judges maybe giving him the first two rounds. It's the kind of thing where I think if Honeycutt has continued to improve off that, then he could, you know, an, an improved version of him could take a, take the decision here or be good enough to win it. And Bradley, yeah, I mean, he's a tough wrestler. Bradley is a compl entirely un underrated and sort of forgotten tough out in MMA. He's a guy who's been a lot around the top end of the sport forever. And, uh, you know, even his losses tend to be all recognizable good fighters. Mike Pierce, Luke Rockhold, Rafael Natal. Yeah. Um, and... So Honeycutt, you know, he would be maybe a small step down from some of those with where he is in his career right now. But Honeycutt does look like, I mean, Honeycutt has some of the natural athleticism and power that is just going to be hard to match. He may not have the technique to out-wrestle Paul Bradley right now, but he was hitting him a lot harder in that fight. And it's just one of those things where, like, it just seems like he can muscle through a lot of Paul Bradley's game. Hmm. So well, at least for a round and a half, because he was fading yeah. in that second. He was fading. He was absolutely fading. So that's. I don't really want to know what that third round would have looked with, like. With with the young fighters, I you expect them to get better. You know, that's the big thing. Is that even if he's fading, like does he fade the next time out? Is that something that he's learned from, or I don't know. But it's, that's fading. That's fading without even having to stop the takedown, because Bradley wasn't. Yeah. He wasn't even trying to take him down. No, it's true. It's true. Honeycutt's Honeycutt's build, like his his musculature and how big his, his arms are comparatively. I mean, he could he could just have the kind of build that is prone to gassing out because he's so big and strong, and he you know it's gonna be so much muscle going into all of his punches and to all of his technique. And that's ironic because Bradley has uh, even bigger build. Yeah. Know? Packing even more muscle. Well, that I think that's why you see Bradley is such a such a low output fighter. Mm. He's learned to be such a low output fighter is to keep right. himself gassing out. And that's I think a lot of that's that alliance style, all that footwork he does because that's yeah. Paul Bradley has underrated footwork for such a big guy. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's constantly moving, constantly just moving and moving, and that that's you know that takes a lot of energy for sure. Yeah. So it's a tough one. I think it should be. I think it should be closer to a coin flip. I might lean Honeycutt just because I, I I talk to him. I like him. I expect to see him prove. It's hard for me to vote to, to vote against somebody you talk to. That's, you know, yeah. one of the great reasons to not trust people who do a lot of interviews to do analysis <laughs> because talk to the guys. interview bias. Yep. But uh, I think Bradley's going to be the the just that learning lesson that Honeycutt's going to need to. Yeah. Get his ass in gear. A loss here would not be bad for Honeycutt at all. No. It's something he could handle. It's it's a big, experienced, tough fighter. It's the kind of guy that a lot of guys are going to lose too early in their career. No shame in it. Odds, Paul Bradley is the underdog, plus 220 up to plus 257. Chris Honeycutt, the favorite, minus 293 up to minus 300. I think those odds are whack. So, but, well, it's it's kind of it's smart matchmaking yeah. in a way because either guy can lose and it won't really hurt their profile that much. You know, Honeycutt can move on and probably beat a bigger name afterwards, maybe, and it'll like oh, you know, it doesn't look that bad. So it's kind of it's it's actually something that they deserve a little praise for there. Yeah. You don't like the odds, Zane? For Honeycutt being that heavy a favorite. Oh, okay. I thought you minus two ninety three to minus three hundred. Okay. I thought you were saying it should be longer than that. No, no, no. I was saying it should okay. be, you know, maybe Closer. plus one eighty, minus one eighty kind of thing. Right. 
Also, look what's going on with me right here. This this is what I'm having to deal with. You see that? <laughs> is is she snoring? She no, she is like laying in wait in the corner, wait looking at something down there. Oh. That, that is her her curiosity face. Uh oh. I think she got lost a toy under there. So that means you need to go get it. <laughs> yeah, I do. But <laughs> just so do she it can now. lose it right again under there. Exactly. All right. That brings us to the main event. Paul Daly, Andy Urich. Um, Vic, I believe you're leading the way here. Are you going anywhere other than Paul Daly? <laughs> okay, here's the thing. Uh, you're talking about a guy, Andy Urich, just a little background on him. He's 11-5 and five currently, and he's another guy who's kind of kicked around on the regional scene. He has uh, fought in Bellator before. And, uh, you know, he's, he's had some pretty bad losses. You know, he's had, oh, my God, she's so cute. Oh, I just want to give her a big old hug. She's cute. Uh, all right, well, yeah, so back to this whole thing. Andy Yurick is a wrestler first. You know, a lot of chain grappling, a lot of single leg to double leg. He will hold you against the, 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 uh, the cage. He will start working and breaking you down from there. Paul Daly hasn't done that great against certain wrestlers. You know, obviously, Andy Yurick is... Uh, not necessarily Josh Koscheck, but I can see something similar that, to what happened with the Koscheck fight of Yurik pretty much holding him down, controlling him. And this fight may not necessarily go where Bellator, in the direction that Bellator may have wanted it to go. Uh, obviously, they're putting a bit of uh, hype behind Paul Daly, as they kind of showed. He's a marketable guy. Um, I just, you know, I, I, can, I can see Andy Yurik pulling it off. But somehow, I do think that Paul Daly is smart enough to pull a rabbit out of the hat and just uncork that left hand from hell and put him away. Um, I think Yurik has really good chances of winning this fight, though. Uh, this isn't this isn't Melvin Gillard versus Brandon Gers, where you know the unknown wrestler comes in and just straight up dominates in the grappling, and then you're just pretty much left with a few flurries in the end of the fight. I don't see that really happening. I think Daly's going to have some opportunities. He's not really a slouch on the ground, though. Um, Daly has worked on being able to get up off his back. He's not going to throw submissions. He's just going to focus on getting the guy off him and then working his way from there, whether he has to use the cage to do so, whether he has to push the guy, tickle his ear, do whatever. But, um, yeah, I, I can I can see something here going on where, where uh, Yurik is going to drag him into some deep water and Daly is going to find a way to survive. So um, that's pretty much where I'm going with this. I'm going to go with Paul Daly, but do expect... Do you expect Andy Yurick to uh, do some pretty impressive things, even though he's going to probably lose? All right. All right. You feeling that, Eddie? Is that, is that... Nah, I don't expect impressive things from Yurick. Um, Be that way, yeah. fine. He's, he's the number two <laughs> middleweight in Mississippi. <laughs> I mean, the, hey, the, the Mississippians are tough, okay? <laughs> they are. I'll give him that. Um but, yeah, I mean, I kind of feel like this is just another softball for Paul Daly. I feel like Daly's, you know, he hasn't had a tough fight since uh, Alexander Yolkov or... or Yolkov. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I don't know what's going on with this guy. Are they just seriously trying to build him that much? And, I mean, he's not even, like, starching these guys necessarily. Uh, I mean, against Olsen, he did pretty well, but, I mean, I don't know. I just don't know what I think of Paul Daly. Like, is he past his prime? And are we just... Is this, like... Well, he should it? be. By all, by all consideration, he started fighting in 2003. He should be well past his prime by now. Yeah. Right. He kind of he kind of is, like... But he's not... He hasn't had a hard fall from his prime. He's tapering yeah. off, I'd say, if anything. So he's, he's yeah, pretty yeah. much near the end of it at this point. But, I mean, that's not... It happens to everybody. You know, it's the arc. I can tell I just, you he's going to be... He's going to be done fighting within the next couple of years, sounds yeah. like. Yeah, I mean, he sure. said it himself. I mean, I just, he doesn't fight people who are tough. I just don't know. I don't know. I, I, I don't know about that because, I mean, Bellator has been giving him, like, really tough, scrappy grapplers. You know, I, I don't know if that's just some sort of test or what, but, I mean, it's something. It's better than just giving him guys Come who. On, man. Like, he fought Tyron Woodley, Nick Diaz, you know, Scott Smith, Mosby Dog. You know, yeah. Koscheck, Dustin Hayes, like Mark Cannon. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I've seen him yeah. fight these guys. Why yeah. is he fighting these regional guys? This is true. If you're going to put this much promotional uh, uh, hype behind a guy, 
it kind of would be, you, you do sort of expect them to start fighting bigger names. You know, Josh Thompson is another example of this. Like, I just, you know, yeah, I, well, I agree trying, with you. There. I think they're trying to get these guys warmed back up for big fights. And daily, they're probably just trying to keep him busy so they can get Josh Koscheck a win or two. And then, Koscheck might be done. Koscheck might never fight again. His I know. injury was undisclosed also, which is weird. Yeah. Mm. But, um... Real that, hush, hush. That's obvious. I mean, that's the fight to make for them, to try to make. But they have to get Josh Koscheck back in the cage at yeah. least once. Well, why do they... He's calling out Vanderlei Silva now. He wants Vanderlei. Yeah. Okay, sure, but why, why does... Why does Bellator want Koscheck versus Daly too? Like the first one was the not. They can sell. I want to see it. Is it really though? I mean, the only yeah, exciting part it. of the last fight was what happened after the fight. I mean. I mean, what was? But that's why we want to see it again. Part? What, what right? was the it's... last fun part of Hoist Gracie versus Ken Shamrock? <laughs> I don't know. Exactly. Exactly. You can't answer that. There was no, no fun part. Okay, what the reason for a rematch is because now they're really old. And yeah. so now you, it's 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 not about it, it's not about like skill or like wow they did it they did a great job the first time around let's see it again it's like no this is absolute chaos and possibly morally reprehensible and we're gonna put it on because I know we motherfuckers are gonna watch so here Love we go MMA. Yeah. it's animosity animosity sells man there's bad blood we want to see a we want to see a street fight in the cage that's yeah. like everyone's thing yeah. they so you end up with like cage. yeah you end up with Bob Sapp versus Akabono and and Ryzen and you're like oh shit this was a terrible idea no yeah. that was such an awesome idea <laughs> oh, yeah yeah it played off real well yeah I'm, I'm sure I mean come on man that's no, <laughs> no MMA, MMA that you can't ignore the circus in MMA you can't it's Bellator is not. Yeah, well, they are not also, ignoring the circus. I, I'm not. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I'm some you know high and mighty guy who's above all this. Like I'll still watch. I'm just not in a hurry to watch it. I'll DVR it. I'll postpone it. I'm oh, not sure. really in a hurry to watch no, it. Nobody's saying you have to be on. You know, you, nobody's saying you have to be there. You know, in the audience in front row I mean, buying. I'm the not tickets. paying for it. I know that much. You know, so I kind of removes a bit of the the but sort I'm of factor. I, I I don't. We're, this board is just too like it's too nuts for too, there's too many parts of it that are too weird and it always has been yeah. for me to just be like I don't want to see that that's not part of the sport I love it's like no the sport right. the sport I love is fully embracing the spectacle it, yeah Keith Hackney versus uh, what's his Emmanuel name Yarborough. <laughs> Emmanuel Yarborough Emmanuel Yarborough yeah <laughs> now hang on a second I'll do you one better Takayama Fry exactly. Like oh, yeah, but see that I can get behind. There's a there's a good kind of insanity there. This is just well, Vic. How do you feel about you know the senior league that's kind of developing, where you got these older guys fighting other <sighs> older guys? I don't know, man. I don't know. This this is it. Still feels weird. Like I'm not that upset about Shamrock versus Gracie and Bellator because I, I it's Shamrock's not going to get punched in the head too much, you know. And Hoist looks like he could probably still take a few licks. But then again, this whole thing is in Texas. Will Shamrock be allowed to wear shoes? Is there that? Does that loophole exist where Hoist might be able to wear the gi? Because those are the rumors out there, you know. So I, I don't know, man. It's it's just really, really weird to me. I, I'm not. I don't know how I feel about this just yet. Yeah, I mean, if they're healthy enough to do it, I say why not? You know, why not? If they if they can't be a commentator. Let him go slug it out. Get I'm David Henderson involved. Listen, I'm not a fan of, of unnecessary brain trauma in general, but when it comes to older guys like that, it's even worse. It's like it's just demoralizing. See these guys going out there for a paycheck like that. It just it starts to feel a little a little too much. Like, no, you could have stayed home, Gramps. You don't need this. You don't you don't want these problems. Yeah, I I will say this. I talked to Ken Shamrock not long ago. And it he you know, and I can't even, I haven't talked to him before then, so I can't tell you, like, oh, I, I know he's, you know, obviously he feels, he sounds better than the last time I talked to him, no. But he sounds happy. Like, yeah. that for a lot of these guys, I think that's one thing that fans overlook. Because I, you know, and I'm not saying, I, I'm the first one who's on the bandwagon of, like, everybody has a career arc, you will decline, you will get worse, you will get hurt, you will lose. But what a lot of fans forget is, like, some of these dudes, what the fuck, what, what else are they going to do? Like, what else do they want to do? And yeah. is their life going to be more valuable without this in it? 
And not everybody is going to be able to open a gym too. We need to be realistic about these things. There, there, they are. There are a lot of guys that have very, very limited options. And Ken Shamrock, yeah, I can see him being one of those guys. But you know, if you look back at that fight against Kimbo Slice, you really want to see him get knocked out like that again? I, I don't want. No, I'm not even saying I want to see it. But I'm saying, it, look, if he wants to do it, yeah, I guess that's his business because. You know, you don't know what what's going on in these people's lives. You don't know what they need. Yeah. You don't know what's going to make them happy. You don't know what's going to make them fulfilled. And I'm just saying. And another thing, like if you saw two grown ass men in their fifties about to duke it out on the streets, are you going to step in and be like, "Whoa, you guys are old. Stop it"? No, this. that's different because I haven't seen them get the shit beat out of them consistently over decades, like I have Ken Shamrock. I and know. Ken Shamrock's getting paid. You know what I mean? Like this. There's a, there's a different aspect to that whole thing that I just I, I don't really feel comfortable with. And look, at some point, I don't know, in some cases, not every time, but in some cases, somebody needs to save these dudes from themselves. You know, I, I, you just when you see a guy getting like these explode dudes getting 15 knockouts on their record, like, bro, you, we need to evaluate this. This shit is not right for you. It's just not working. And that's just something that, you know, obviously that's a more drastic example, but you guys see what I mean. It's Yeah, but I mean, in case of the explode thing, you know, you're talk, if you're talking about some junkie who's yeah, true. getting beat up, like, are you really then like, no, you can't be doing this. You need to go back in the streets and, like, <laughs> where I can't see you. Like, Get back on that park bench. We don't know what is going on in these people's lives to say, yeah. this is what's worst for you. It's like, no, this might be absolutely the best thing they're going to do all year. But like, on the same token, there's something to be said for, you know, commissions who sanction oh, these sure. bouts and physicals. Yeah, and, yeah I mean, you know, it, yeah. look, I'm all for better commission regulation. I'm all for better regulation. I'm all for them saying, look, no, we're not going to let you fight. We have decided you do not meet these X conditions. We cannot let you fight. I'm all for family members of these people being like, yeah. dude – we know this is a terrible idea. You should stop. But if I'm a fan on the outside, like, I don't know what the fuck's going on with your life. I don't know. I do not know where you're at. So that's kind of my take on it. It's just like, if, if from the outside, if you are on the outside, you just don't know what's going on with these people, what they need, what what is good for them. No, that's the, that's totally correct, though. Yeah, you're right there. All right. On that note. Oh, but wait, real fast. I'm oh. picking Paul Daly. You're picking Paul Daly. I'm picking All right. Paul Daly. All right. So, jump in on the odds here. Odds for Paul Daly are minus 750 to minus 707 for Paul Daly. Andy Urich uh, plus 553 down to plus 475. So pretty long. I would say probably a little more of that is based on Paul Daly's legacy at this point than his recent performances. But I think it's safe. I, I think it's reasonable to expect him to win. Yeah. On that note, time to close up the show. You can find me on Twitter at Zane Simon. You can find Vic on Twitter at Vic M. Rodriguez. You can find Eddie on Twitter at the Eddie Mercado. You can find all of us on Bloody Elbow. Subscribe to MMANation.com. That's D-O-T-C-O-M over on YouTube. That's where you get all our analysis, all our videos, all our shows, all that good stuff. Give this video a like. That's a thumbs up. That helps us out a ton. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We'll be back at you at the sixth round and then gearing up for next week with Knuckle Up, Care Don't Care, If I Did It, Vivisections, all that good stuff. So see you all then. Thanks for joining me. Till next time.